Uh, okay, can I get everyone's attention, please? We are now starting the introduction. Um, so a few things for the people who are visiting us here in person. Um, if you're on the floor, which most of you are, maybe you can try to scoot forward a little bit so that the people in the back don't feel too uh, claustrophobic. There's a bit of room up here. You can leave space for people to walk, but if you just scoot forward a little bit, might be a bit more comfortable. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. Uh, the next thing I ask is that everyone take out their phone and turn it on silent. So if you have a phone, take it out and wave it high like you're proud of it, and then turn it on silent. Thank you. Um, yeah, so tonight, uh, tonight is our event, an evening with Chomsky. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this uh, this event is organized by Kulturikeiras RU. Uh, it is our passion to organize memorable and gratifying events, such as concerts, creative writing, and initiating open discussion on controversial issues, among others. Uh, today, following this passion, it is our honor to welcome Professor Noam Chomsky to share his views on the war in Ukraine global safety concerns, and the development of our economy. <clears throat> Chomsky is an MIT professor emeritus of linguistics and philosophy. In addition to these two subjects, uh, he became famous for his lectures and writing on intellectual history, contemporary and international affairs, and foreign policy. Several pristine Institutions have recognized Chomsky's work with honorary degrees, including the Universities of Chicago, Delhi, Pennsylvania, Cambridge, Buenos Aires, Harvard, Calcutta, and many others. His trophy shelf is home to many awards, such as the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award of the American Psychological Association, the Kyoto Prize in Sciences, the Helmholtz Medal, and the Dorothy Eldridge, Peace, Eldridge Peacemaker Award. Noam's, uh, Mr. Chomsky's most recent books include Requiem for the American Dream, uh, Occupy, Making the Future, and Gaza in Crisis. Um, the program will go as such. In just a few minutes, uh, Chomsky will join us and uh, should finish his lecture in about an hour or less. Uh, followed by a Q&A. Uh, please be reminded that Chomsky relies on the speech to text function. So please speak calmly and close to the microphone. Uh, maybe a bit calmer than I'm speaking even. Uh, and uh, limit your questions to about one minute or less. Uh, before Chomsky joins our session, we would propose you keep in mind a few themes uh, during the lecture. Uh, what's the purpose of NATO? What does NATO membership mean for Finland? And also the security of Finnish democracy in a global setting. In just a few minutes, we'll have Dr. Chomsky here speaking with us. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, we've had our introduction, so uh, we're, we're grateful that you're here tonight with us, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay. Uh, how do you want to work it? You want me to just talk about what's on my mind, or do you have specific questions you want me to address? Uh, we'd love if you would if you would speak with us uh, about what's on your mind uh, specifically. Um, if you have thoughts on the war with Ukraine, we live in Finland, so we're quite close to the action. Um, and then also uh, perhaps the current economic events that we're facing today. Yeah. And then uh, if you have time at the end, we may have a few Q and A uh, for just a short period of time. The Wonderful. more interaction and discussion, the better I like it. Okay. And the better it usually is for everyone. So let me start with Ukraine. Yes. Uh, the background of the war is not really in any serious dispute, I'll run through quickly what you're all familiar with. Uh, we can go back to the 
Gorbachev, Bush, number Bush, Bush number one, discussions uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, there was a question of, and it's still a question of uh, what the shape, what the shape of the world system would be, particularly Eurasia, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, there were different visions. Uh, there still are. Uh, one vision is uh, so-called Atlanticist vision. The uh, uh, world, the world system, should be based on a military alliance, NATO, run by the United States. Uh, Europe should be Western Europe should be component of it. Uh, the other uh, vision proposed by Gorbachev, uh, there should be a common European home extending from Lisbon to Vladivostok, uh, no military alliances, uh, Europe and Russia co-equals, uh, both being transformed towards uh, in a social democratic uh, direction. Uh, the uh, key issue at the center of this was the fate of Germany, obviously the most important, uh, the industrial center of the uh, of Europe. Uh, Gorbachev agreed to allow Germany to join, to be unified, first of all, and to join NATO which is considerable concession on the part of any Russian leader considering the history, which I don't have to review. Uh, there was a quid pro quo, uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush one, agreed uh, that uh, in return, NATO would not expand to the east, not beyond East Germany. But, uh, Clinton was elected in the next election. He began to erode the system very quickly. Uh, began to move to incorporate uh, Eastern European states uh, within NATO. Uh, he was warned, in fact, for 30 years. Uh, high US officials, practically everyone who had any uh, familiar with Eastern Europe or involvement in it. And Reagan's ambassador to Moscow, Jack Matlock, one of the experts in, on, in the diplomatic corps on Russia, Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, a host of others. I won't run through them. Uh, the hawkish defense secretary of Bush II, Robert Gates, uh, current and past CIA directors, it's a long list, all warn that while Russia would tolerate expansion of Eastern Europe, the NATO to Eastern European states, it had definite red lines, which it would not tolerate any Russian, this is long before Putin, any Russian leader. Uh, the red lines were Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, Russia would not accept them being incorporated within a hostile military alliance. Well, that was understood on all sides. And that continues, actually continues to the present to be a crucial issue. Uh, the, uh, uh, the second Bush administration, Bush II, uh, 2008, uh, invited Ukraine into NATO over the objections of his own defense secretary, Robert Gates, warned this was reckless and provocative. Uh, France and, v and Germany vetoed it at the time, but given US power, it remained on the agenda. After the Maidan uprising in 2014, uh, the US began quite openly to move to integrate Ukraine within NATO de facto. Uh, 
In fact, US military journals now simply say that Ukraine is a de facto member of NATO. Uh, it's increased under President Biden, uh, formal declarations that, uh, that moves must continue to uh, uh, send Western arms to Ukraine, uh, carry out joint military operations, uh, train Ukrainians in US weapons, uh, and in effect move um, uh, the Bush, Bush Biden administration announced that uh, uh, Ukraine must remain in an enhanced program of uh, uh, NATO uh, membership sometime in the future. Meanwhile, Russia continued to make the same statements. A couple of weeks before the invasion, Prime Minister Lavrov once again said the issue, main issue, is the, uh, Ukraine's joining NATO. Russia, he said, is going to insist on neutralization of Ukraine. That's, uh, that's the fundamental issue. Well, the censorship in the United States is so extreme that most Americans never heard this. Have to go to roundabout ways since uh, to find it out since Russian sources are pretty much banned in the US by now. Uh, but that's been the position essentially up to the invasion. It's the background. It doesn't justify the invasion. Aggression is aggression, never justified. Uh, the major crime invasion of Ukraine is comparable to the US invasion of Iraq, uh, Hitler Stalin invasion of Poland, other acts of aggression through history, uh, but it was obviously provoked, uh, so seriously provoked. And that uh, uh, raises an interesting question about uh, uh, US discourse in scholarship, in journalism, media, general journals. I'm sure you've seen it. It's considered necessary by writers to refer to the Russian invasion as the unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's a very interesting phrase. It's actually almost never been used before. You can check it on Google if you like, look up unprovoked invasion, almost never used, but it's, it's, it's been used hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times with regard to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which was of course provoked and everyone knows it. Uh, you can turn to your favorite psychiatrist to explain why an invasion that is known to be provoked is constantly referred to as unprovoked, even though that term had almost never been used before. Uh, that's the current situation. Uh, the United States announced before the invasion, uh, sorry, right after the invasion, that it had refused to take into account any Russian security concerns in the discussions prior to the invasion. Still remains true. Take a look at official US policy. It was announced uh, most clearly at the conference in April, May, sorry, in May at the Rammstein Air Base in Germany, where the United States brought together the NATO powers and some others to uh, essentially dictate NATO policy. Now, the policy was announced by Defense Secretary Austin. He said the goal of NATO policy now is to continue the war in order to weaken Russia. In fact, to weaken Russia so severely that it will not be able to undertake any act of aggression again. Well, you can ask yourself exactly what that phrase means. Literally, it means that uh, the conditions on Russia must be harsher than those of the 
Versailles Treaty in 1919, which did not succeed in preventing Germany from uh, carrying out aggression again. Whether that's what the US has in mind, nobody knows. But you can guess that uh, the targets of the policy will give it the literal interpretation. Well, that's what we were, that, that, can, that policy was then strengthened and reiterated at the NATO summit a couple of weeks ago. The goal must be to continue to war, the war to harm Russia severely. Meanwhile, all the horrors continue for Ukraine, for tens of millions of people around the world facing starvation with the cutoff of food and fertilizers from the Black Sea region, a reversal of critical, critically needed efforts to uh, address the severe problems of climate change. Just a couple of hours ago, if you looked at the newspaper, the latest newspapers, new scientific study announced that the Greenland ice sheet alone, forgetting everything else, will add a, about a, a foot of um, sea level rise just with inevitably with the global warming that's already taken place not made most of it by the year 2100 uh, and of course the constant indeed growing threat of nuclear war well that's where things now stand uh, with regard to the crisis of neoliberalism we have to ask ourselves exactly what the crisis is. We've lived under the neoliberal regime for about 40 years, can measure its effects, a lot of evidence. Just take the United States, which is the most closest, closely studied. Similar conclusions around the world, worse elsewhere. Uh, in the United States, the neoliberal policies have been an enormous success for the designers of the policies. In fact, the uh, recent study by the quasi-governmental, highly respected Rand Corporation concluded that uh, the transfer of wealth to the top 1% of the population in the United States uh, had amounted to about $50 trillion, trillion dollars during these 40 years. That's robbery of the middle classes, the working classes, uh, real wages are about what they were in 1979, uh, plenty of growth, but into very few pockets. Of course, this means uh, undermining of the democratic system with extremely high concentration of wealth. That's a highway robbery on a pretty effective scale. It's had its effects. Uh, the United States is the only country alone in which for the last 40 years, mortality has been increasing. That doesn't happen anywhere except in the context of war or severe pestilence. This is happening in the richest society in the world. Enormous advantages that no one else has. Estimates are that current estimates that about a million people have died just from increase of mortality alone in the United States. The same has happened in other dimensions. So, for example, take uh, incarceration. Uh, in the United States, uh, in the 1970s, incarceration rates were about the same as Europe. Now they're about five to ten times as high. Uh, this is one of the effects of 
social breakdown caused by these highly successful policies of massive robbery of the population. A large percentage, large majority of the population lives from paycheck to paycheck, highly precarious existence. Uh, the 1970s, take another dimension, health. 1970s, US health standards were about like Europe. Health costs were about like Europe. Now, uh, health costs are about twice as high per capita as comparable societies, and you have some of the worst outcomes. Uh, infant mortality, other measures, the US is far behind, and way behind in social benefits. I mean, which have all been torn to shreds during the uh, neoliberal years. So it takes something as simple as uh, maternity leave, leave, guaranteed leave for women after birth. The United States is the only country that doesn't have it outside of a couple of Pacific islands. And it goes across the board. Well, if there are effects, one effect is uh, large part of the very large part of the population is angry, resentful, bitter, uh, growing contempt for institutions, uh, easy prey for demagogues of the Trump variety who can stand up with one hand raised with a banner saying, I love you, and the other hand stabbing you in the back all the legislative programs uh, has an impact, great impact. So the voting base, take a look at the Republican Party now, it's, it's been described by even the former director of the CIA, uh, other uh, leading international journalists, Financial Times of London, as uh, the most nihilistic, uh, contemptible, dangerous uh, political organization in the world. They're about to take power again, probably in the most powerful state in the world. Uh, you take a look at the attitudes among the voting base, it's uh, pretty shocking. And about 70% of Republicans I believe that uh, Donald Trump won the last election. About 50% think that the Democratic Party is run by a group of uh, pedophiles and sex perverts who are trying to uh, groom children to, into uh, sexual uh, uh, pedophilia and other sexual perversions. That's half the Republican Party. About two thirds of them believe that the Democrats are trying to organize a campaign to uh, destroy the white race by bringing non-whites into the country. Now, these are beliefs that were held by tiny neo-Nazi fringe uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Now it's the majority of the party. You can see the future of the party very clearly in what has just been happening, first in Budapest, then a couple of weeks later in Dallas, Texas, uh, major conferences uh, where the, uh, the core of the Republican Party was the star representative, con conservative, uh, uh, the Legislative Action Conference. It's basically the core of the Republican Party. Their hero is Viktor Orban. His uh, policies of creating a proto-fascist, uh, Christian nationalist, uh, uh, white uh, supremacist, uh, illiberal, what he calls illiberal democracy, meaning virtually no democracy. That's the model of the future. 
he was hailed by President Trump, other speakers, leading television personalities. Now that's the future they have in store, that they have in mind. Well, that's what's happening. That's one aspect of the crisis of neoliberalism. You look at other countries, Western Europe, it's not the same, but there are similarities, considerable similarities. The, uh, the third world, it's been a total disaster. Structural adjustment programs have devastated third world societies. In fact, a large part of the background for the uh, terrible uh, massacres and destruction in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, large part of the background was structural adjustment neoliberal programs that had undermined and uh, shattered the existing societies, brought to the core uh, ethnic rivalries, tensions, conflicts, uh, which led, led to the monstrosities that followed. Well, that's the crisis of neoliberalism. Is it, it's a crisis for the world. In fact, it's a death sentence for the world because one crucial aspect of it, crucial, is denial of warming of the planet. In the case of the Republican Party in the United States, it's 100% of the leadership, literally. Take a look at the last uh, Republican primary, 2016. Since then, the party's just been owned by President Trump, former President Trump. But the last, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, presidential primary was in 2016, cream of the crop of the Republican leadership. This is before Trump, remember. Uh, every single one either denied that global warming is taking place or said, maybe it is, but we don't care. We're not gonna do anything about it. We're gonna to continue to burn coal, increase fossil fuel production, cut back efforts to mitigate the effects. Once Trump was elected, he still carried that forward. Remains the case. Just recently, Congress did pass a very limited climate change program, something not worthless, but much less than is needed. A hundred percent Republican opposition, not the slightest deviation. Well, you're very likely coming back to office in November, can predict the effects. To repeat, it's kind of a death sentence for the world. We don't have, we do have time to deal with and overcome the severe problems of heating the environment, but not much time. A couple more years of maximizing the threat will very likely pass irreversible tipping points, uh, after which we just wait for the disaster to unfold and it'll be catastrophic, something indescribable. That's if we avoid the growing threat of nuclear war. Well, that's the crisis of neoliberalism. It's not the one that's usually talked about, but it's the actual one. Well, I've talked for too long, so why don't I turn this over to you and your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Um... I'll start us off with the first question since I have the mic. Um, you talked about the threat of nuclear war and uh, and sort of the background of NATO. Uh, Finland and Sweden are in the process of joining NATO and that's been, of course, on everyone's mind here. Do you have any thoughts or insight on how, on, on what we as citizens of these countries can ex expect uh, any kind of changes in the geopolitical uh, 
sphere or uh, repercussions or anything like that? What what can we expect? Well, it's very it's, it's been very interesting to watch. I've had a number of conversations about it, actually in Sweden, uh, but they're quite interesting. Uh, both in Sweden and Finland, there are two reigning ideas. One of them is gloating over the demonstration of the fact that uh, Russia is a paper tiger. It's military is so totally incompetent, uh, badly led, uh, ill-equipped, uh, that it can't conquer uh, cities a couple of kilometers from its border. So a lot of gloating about that. All the talk about Russian military competence has been demonstrated to be a joke. That's one idea. The other idea is that Russia is such an extraordinary threat that it's just about to uh, overwhelm uh, Europe, uh, NATO, uh, uh, reach the goals of Peter the Great and so on. Well, interesting to ask how those two ideas can coexist in the same mind. Leave it to you to figure that one out. Consequences of uh, NATO and Finland joining of Sweden and Finland joining NATO are pretty obvious. One of them, in fact, was stated by uh, the Russian command almost immediately by Putin. Uh, of course, this means, he said, that Russia will have to increase its, uh, he said, defense. Everyone uses the word defense. Its military force on the 1300 kilometer border uh, and to be ready to prepare for uh, eventual conflict. Uh, within Finland and Sweden themselves, uh, what will presumably happen and presumably what was the motive for this is further integration, now total integration into the NATO military system had already existed, as you know. Uh, Finland and Sweden both have quite substantial military industries. Uh, they have been substantially integrated into NATO. There have been joint military operations, uh, uh, many other forms of integration. And now that proceeds to 100%. It's a big boon for the uh, military industry in uh, Finland and uh, Sweden, both quite sophisticated and developed. Now they can move forward. It'll also very likely have the side effect of driving both countries further to the right, uh, carrying out further erosion of their social democratic uh, features, which has been happening for some time, will now probably accelerate. It's very hard to think of any further motive for the act of joining NATO or any other likely consequences of it. Now, uh, Dr. Chomsky, if you are not uh, very aware of Finnish culture, you will now experience a little bit of it. Um. Okay, um, so I'm actually more of a linguistics student, so it might not be surprising that I focused on your wording. And I noticed that you called the US the most powerful country in the world when, we were, when you were talking about the Republican Party. And I'm not all that knowledgeable about just how powerful the US actually is. But to me, it sounded a little bit like the general talking about American exceptionalism. So I'm mainly just curious what your reasoning or your motivation is for calling the US the most powerful country in the world, especially now that Russia, China have also been very much on the rise internationally. Thank you. 
just simple theft. Take, say, the military dimension. The U.S. is so far in the lead that there's nothing even to discuss. The U.S. military spending is uh, about, I think, five times as high as China, the next largest, and per capita, of course, far beyond. Uh, Russia isn't this is fifth or sixth. Uh, uh, Russia, the United States military spending is greater than the next 10 countries combined that followed it. The United States has 800 military bases around the world. Uh, Russia has one in Syria. Uh, China has one in Djibouti. And Britain and France have two or three somewhere. Uh, the uh, US-based multinational corporations have about 50% of the world's total wealth. They're first in just about every category, first or second. Uh, the United States has unusual advantages, huge territory, homoge pretty homogeneous population. You can go from uh, Boston to Los Angeles, about 2,500 miles, and think you're in the same place. Weather's a little bit different. Uh, enormous internal natural resources, agricultural, mineral, uh, no enemies, controls the Western Hemisphere, controls both open, both oceans, opposite sides of most of the opposite sides of both oceans. I mean, pick your dimension. The United States is just supreme. It's been that way. Uh, actually, it was the richest country in the world back in the 19th century. After the Second World War, it became the dominant military power, global power, nobody else even close. Uh, China is uh, growing and developing. Uh, it uh, has enormous internal problems. It's considered a great threat to the United States, but not because of its military power. Uh, but it's considered a threat because of its development and crucially because it does not follow orders. That's crucial. It's very different from Europe. Europe has an enormous economy, comparable or even beyond the United States. A uh, very high level of education, and culture, uh, functioning societies, but it's not a threat to the United States. It follows orders. So when the United States imposes sanctions on Iran to punish Iran for the fact that the United States undermined the uh, joint agreement on nuclear programs, Europe strongly objects. Uh, a lot of angry rhetoric. Uh, we oppose this. We don't want it. But nevertheless, Europe adheres to the sanctions. Uh, take, say, Cuba, which the United States has been subjecting to torture, violence for 60 years. Nothing like it in world affairs. Europe strongly objects. In fact, the entire world objects. If you look at the United Nations vote, the last one was 184 to two, opposed to the sanctions. Two are the United States and Israel, client state, has to vote with the United States. Strongly opposes the sanctions, but they all adhere to them, including Swiss, Sweden, and Sweden and Finland. Uh, can't use Cuba nickel can't send uh, syringes to Cuba for uh, injections for uh, vaccines because the United States says no. Well, that's the world. They obey. China doesn't. China disregards U.S. orders. That's an intolerable threat. In fact, if you think about it, that's the threat of China. On the other hand, if you go back to your question, 
Why do I say the US is the most powerful country in the world? Because no matter what dimension you look at, that's what you find. Well, you mentioned the phrase American exceptionalism. That's a different, different term altogether. American exceptionalism is the concept that the United States is uniquely benign, that uh, everything it does is for the benefit of others. It's so altruistic that it even suffers because of its goodwill to others. And that's American exceptionalism. Very dominant theme in American discourse, international relations discourse, scholarship, uh, general commentary, teaching the schools and so on. Now, there's two things wrong with it. One is history, which dramatically undermines it. The other is it's not exceptional. You go back to other dominant world powers, they were the same. When Britain was the dominant world power, carrying for hundreds of years, carrying out horrendous crimes and atrocities all over the world, British intellectuals were talking about uh, what an angelic country England is. So, so marvelous that others can't even understand their benevolence. They criticize us, uh, quote John Stuart Mill, probably the most respected and respectable uh, modern intellectual in the English speaking world, right at the peak of Britain's atrocities in India, 1857, which he was well aware of. He wrote an article about how England is so angelic that other countries heap obloquy on us because they cannot comprehend their magnificence. And we must extend our conquest of India for the benefit of the barbarians who need our tender mercy and so on. French were the same. Well, the French generals were calling literally for extermination of the Algerians, and French intellectual French intellectuals were uh, orating about uh, France's uh, civilizing mission in the world. I don't think you can find an exception to this. At least I've never found one. So American exceptionalism isn't exceptional, and it's entirely in conflict with uh, the historical record. But that's a different matter from US power, both economic, uh, military, uh, the uh, advantages and security, well, almost anywhere you look. The US is indeed destroying itself from within. That's a different matter. Uh, from the chat that we have, we have some people joining us from distance. Uh, so I will read this. Uh, is it true that Russia has held its sphere of influence in Eastern Europe for the last two centuries? Uh, or it is true. Uh, but is there any reason that we or Eastern Europe should allow it to continue uh, other than to satisfy the egos of the Russian policymakers? First of all, it's very far from true. Uh, Russia was virtually destroyed twice in the last century uh, by Germany alone. Uh, that's not having a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. It's quite apart from, uh, actually, if you go back to the 15th century, since about the 15th century, Russia has been declining relative to the West. That decline continued until about a century ago when Russia began to move to become a more developed industrial society. Of course, it's had influence, uh, but uh, to say that it's governed Eastern Europe for two centuries is just not a description of the facts. It was after the Second World War. Then it had its sphere of influence in. Eastern Europe, no reason why any country should have a sphere of influence anywhere. 
France shouldn't control Western Africa. United States should not control most of the world. Uh, of course not. Why should we be in favor of them? Okay. Uh, you have written in, uh, extensively about propaganda and about the propaganda system which uh, we have in, in, in the Western countries. Uh, and it seems that uh, this uh, propaganda system is uh, uh, becoming one more uh, dense. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is there any any chance of having a democratic society when we have a really uh, propaganda in uh, system in media and and all <coughs> very in crucial questions? People uh, for ordinary people, it's uh, impossible to get uh, uh, truthful information. Could we have more democratic media, more free and open information? Sure, we should. We should constantly be struggling to have more. There are plenty of reasons, of factors that impede it in the differ in different societies. So in more authoritarian, totalitarian societies, like contemporary Russia, for example, uh, media are under very tight control. Uh, journalists who criticize or object can be jailed, tortured, uh, very hard to have an independent opinion express it. In more free and open societies, uh, the propaganda system works in different ways. So, uh, gee, this has been discussed extensively for many years, uh, go back to George Orwell, uh, 80 years ago, uh, he wrote his famous uh, animal form, I'm sure you've all read it, satire on a totalitarian enemy. Uh, he also wrote an introduction to animal form, which very likely you didn't read because it was not published was found many years later in his unpublished writings. Uh, the introduction is of some interest. It's addressed to the people of England, free England. He says the book is a satire on the totalitarian enemy, but people in England shouldn't feel too self-righteous about it. I'm now virtually quoting he said, in free England, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. Give some examples, gives a few sentences of how it's done. Uh, one of them is that uh, it's just immersion in the general culture. If you go on to the best schools, you have Oxford and Cambridge, you have instilled into you the understanding that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say, we can go beyond even do to think. In fact, if you look more closely at the mechanisms of thought control in Western societies, which has been deeply investigated, including incidentally by some Finnish scholars, thousands of pages of documentation on this, the basic mechanism is pretty straightforward. There is uh, open discussion in the media, in the journals of opinion, in scholarship. Uh, it's in fact, an open, lively debate is encouraged. But when you look at it, you find that it is within fixed bounds, pretty fixed bounds, which are not expressed. They're simply presupposed. You don't ask questions about them. You just debate within that framework of assumptions. And given the lively debate, people tend to have a feeling that they're probably seeing all sides. Uh, why look anywhere else for information? This is quite extreme in a country like the United States, which happens to be quite insular, partly simply for geographic reasons. 
why look any, but even in the culture, why look anywhere else? So there's um, pretty there's good studies which indicate that Americans may know less about the world than people living in totalitarian societies who distrust their own information systems for good reasons and look outside. Well, that's uh, these are the ways that uh, propaganda systems operate. Uh, there's a ton of information about it, most of it in critical work in the United States and England, but some elsewhere, including Finland. Uh, and uh, uh, how can we go beyond this? Well, by uh, that's what activist critical work is about, trying to encourage the people to question the assumptions that they're taking for granted, to think about things, try to understand them for themselves, uh, raise questions about uh, what's taken to be uh, unchallengeable dogma, uh, develop alternative independent media uh, organizations in which people can get together and think, challenge, and activist work, which uh, tries to change the nature of the social institutions so as to allow more authentic freedom and real democracy. It's what critical intellectuals have been doing ever since Socrates. I mean, yes, that's, that's their task. Uh... We have kind of a line here of questions, and we're also taking from the chat. Um, so I will take one from the chat. Uh, OK, uh, the question from the chat is, you mentioned that the membership of Finland to NATO will, accept, uh, will accelerate a right movement of the country. Could you explain that in more detailed um, and any uh, interested in, in solutions and what can be done to avoid a further right move of the country, uh, especially for a leftist party. And if you have anything to expound on that. Gee, you know all about that much more than I do, but Finland and Sweden have been under significant pressures for some years to erode the social democratic institutions that have been developed, when a country becomes more under the control of militarism and military institutions, it almost reflexively moves to the right. The part of a militarized system, it's the kind of doctrine that you hear, propaganda that you hear, that's where the institutions move towards, it just drags the country to the right, it happens everywhere. I presume it'll happen in Finland and Sweden. My guess is, you know more about it than I do, but my guess is that the pressure to join NATO was probably driven mostly by right-wing elements who are in favor of seeing this take place. That's quite over and above the advantages to a military industry, quite sophisticated military industry in Finland and Sweden for full entry into NATO instead of just partial integration. But that's the usual tendency with militarization of a society. Thank you. Our line starts here, I think. Um, hello? Uh, hello. Um, with Russia being uh, completely isolated from the Western world through through the sanctions, uh, do you see um, Russia coming back to the Western world in any way? And what would that entail? I think what, and first of all, we should be a little cautious about this. You were correct in the question saying isolated from the Western world. It's not under isolated from the world. In fact, in many ways, the Western world is isolated from the world. You know, take a look at sanctions, a map of sanctions. It's Europe and the 
Anglosphere, the English speaking countries, along with Japan, and most of the world is saying, this is none of our business. Uh, India has considerably increased its trade with Russia, China, of course, Indonesia, uh, Russian, the international conferences that are taking place in Indonesia, Africa, the Russians are welcomed to active participants. Uh, uh, so uh, they do deplore the aggression almost universally. The invasion of Ukraine is denounced, but combined with uh, the comment uh, to Western Europe uh, and the United States, uh, basically get off your high horse. You have nothing to talk about. This is what you've been doing to us for centuries. So yes, it's deplorable, but don't pretend to give us any uh, lectures and lessons about high principles. Uh, and they're saying what's become, what you are turning into a proxy war with Russia, with the policy of harming Russia, whatever happens to Ukraine, we don't want to be part of that. Uh, well, what's going to happen? That's really interesting to see. Uh, the uh, Russia undoubtedly will suffer from the sanctions. But Western Europe is suffering even more. Western Europe is being cut off from its natural uh, trade, commercial relations with the basic resource base. I mean, uh, uh, Germany, the German based system, Germany has an intricate uh, production system, very successful. And developed throughout Europe, ranging from Netherlands to Slovakia, relies very heavily on Russian resources. People talk about oil, but plenty more and gas. I mean, even to move towards renewable energy, uh, Western Europe, basically the German based system, uh, have to rely on Russian minerals. Uh, I think sooner or later, we will see in Western Europe questions arising about whether it is worthwhile hanging on to Washington's coattails or whether we should seek to move towards some kind of accommodation with a very natural and essential trading partner, which furthermore, remember, is the gateway to the huge China-based system spreading throughout Eurasia, the Belt and Road, Road Initiative, huge uh, development and uh, investment region based in China, but linking together the whole region. It's already, it's really reaching into Africa, even into Latin America. It's now reaching into Europe. China's just announced a couple of days ago that they're building the world's largest uh, battery manufacturer, fundamental for electrification, in Hungary. Well, Europe is Western Europe's not going to want to say we don't want to be part of this. Uh, right now, China's already a huge uh, export market, and uh, the Eurasian system will be even more tempting. All of that is barred if Europe has, uh, is in direct conflict with R Russia. So I think it's likely over the years that we will see pressures in Western Europe to move towards some kind of accommodation uh, with Russia and moves towards the Eurasian system, China-based system. Could this ever get to something like what Gorbachev called a common European home without military alliances. It's not impossible. I think, uh, in fact, prior to the invasion, if uh, Putin had been a statesman instead of a brutal autocrat, what he would have done, I think, is 
consider Emmanuel Macron's tentative offers up until days before the invasion to move towards an accommodation which would prevent the invasion and lead towards closer relations with Western Europe and Russia, much to the discomfiture of the United States. He didn't do that, could have done it. Maybe some wiser statesman in the Kremlin will see the advantages of that, especially as the war drags on. Maybe there will be tendencies in Western Europe to move into this very natural direction. Can't tell, but I don't think it's unlikely. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Chomsky. Um, I would like to ask something concerning rhetoric and public discourse, particularly around the Ukraine situation. Um, here in Finland, we saw a rapid shift of public opinion for NATO, uh, and it was a quite a drastic shift. And for sure, the NATO hawks here in Finland and elsewhere have been hungry to incorporate Finland into NATO now for decades. Um, but still, observing the rhetoric around the war uh, has made me wonder if there is some kind of um, new conditions um, for the public discourse or like the manufacturing of or engineering of public opinion. For example, um, people talk about uh, politicians, journalists, of being on the right side of history, um, I guess as well here in Finland as elsewhere, like in parts of Europe or US. Likewise, uh, the Finnish people, you would have, could have asked them 10 years ago, um, how is Russian democracy? And most people would have you know, said, there's no democracy in Russia and you know, it's not the fault of Russian people. But quite recently, people seem to be in favor of uh, denying visas for Russian people, uh, because now the Russians are seen as uh, being in responsibility for the war. Whereas earlier, you know, you know, the perpetrator was Putin and his regime, but now uh, quite quickly, people seem to think, no, it's the Russian people. They chose their leader. Um, sorry, I'm taking a bit too long here, but anyway, what do you think has happened in the public discourse uh, recently, particularly in regards of NATO and war in Ukraine? Thank you. Well, uh, let me ask you a simple question. After the US invasion and destruction of Iraq, uh, how many American tourists were barred from Finland? How many sanctions were imposed on the United States? These are the kinds of questions that are being asked in the most of the world to recognize the extraordinary hypocrisy of what's happening in Europe. Um, yes, the Russians, actually the Russian people had not much to do with electing Putin, but the American people had a great deal to do with electing George W. Bush, who carried out the worst crime of this century. Uh, Iraq is far worse uh, crime than the, inv it was the invasion of Ukraine. In fact, if you notice, take a careful look, you'll notice that US and British analysts, military analysts, are wondering why Russia didn't carry out a US-British style war in Ukraine. If the US and Britain had, when they invade a country, whether it's Serbia, Libya, a horror story like Iraq, first thing they do is make the country unlivable. Trains aren't running, communications don't function, the energy system is destroyed. They're very surprised that the Russians didn't do this. I mean, remember that US intelligence was predicting that Russia would conquer Ukraine in a couple of days. 
In fact, they were already planning to fly Zelensky out of the country and set up a government in exile. They were shocked at the invasion. They thought Russia would carry out a US style of invasion. It didn't. Country's functioning. A lot of horrors, a lot of atrocities, but nothing remotely like the US British style of war. Well, were British and American tourists kept out of Finland? Did the, anybody even think of the question? Well, if not, how come this question is being raised? I think that's an interesting thing for uh, people in Finland to think about. Thank you, Dr. Chomsky. Can we have a, a round of applause? Yes, and for all of us, I want to thank you again for your time this evening. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion, and and we all feel uh, very, uh, we'll just speak for all of us, we all feel very uh, moved to be part of it. So thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes. All right. Yes. Good night. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. We will end it now. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>